And I know uh, I, I want us to, I, I have to tell you, I really was sold on the book that we utilized. Uh, for me, it was like a resource, like a Sunday school book when a teacher teaches. Um, that was a great resource, and I appreciate that. Um, and uh, so we'll be looking at where we're going in the future. I'll, I'll declare that to you. So I come your prayers uh, as we do uh, uh, get ready to make a transition. But until then, we want to be excited in the Word of God. And so building upon the thought of, of uh, uh, I am a church member, what that means to us, uh, I, I want to look at a couple of different thoughts tonight of how that we bring that collectively to us how we bring that collectively to our church, uh, how all that may look to us. And uh, I'm going to be jumping to a couple of different places as we look at ourselves uh, uh, tonight. But I want to start out first in Joshua chapter number 24. And uh, some of that may seem like a little bit of uh, uh, deja vu, a little bit of things that you've heard before, a little bit of repeat. Uh, when you look at particularly one verse, but I really want to look at all of chapter 24 for a moment, uh, but but not in great detail. I want to look at it long enough that we get a synopsis of what's going on, and it kind of gives us some ammunition for our life as we move forward. And so when you look at Joshua chapter number 24, you'll find that Joshua is uh, getting ready to say farewell. In fact, if, uh, if you were to look at him in his life, he's giving a farewell address to the folks that God has given him the privilege of leading for a particular period of time. And, and uh, after, after Moses, God raised up Joshua. And uh, what a mighty man he was. And what ability he, uh, he had in his service and, and in his leading. And, and, and the Bible says that he called the tri tri uh, 12 uh, tribes of Israel uh, uh, together. And he, and, he, and he called the elders, uh, their heads, and, and, and all their elected officials. And uh, he said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, uh, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even terror. And he goes on and he talks about how that God worked and moved in the lives of their ancestors. And he brings that as a, a refreshing to them. And he reminds them of what God had done. How that uh, God had, had worked in Abraham's life. We'll talk about that in a bit. And how that when they were in Egypt, God worked. And in their deliverance, God worked. And as God brought them to a new land, that God worked. And so Joshua is, is giving them this address prior to later in the chapter, you'll find that Joshua dies. And so uh, he, he gives that verse that uh, most all of us are familiar with. Joshua charges them with, with, with who they're going to uh, serve and uh, trust in God uh, and, and letting go of idols, uh, letting go of other gods and, and, and taking a hold of God for who He is. And uh, he talked about how that when the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt, he said, when you were being led through the Red Sea, God put your enemy in darkness. Amen. The water overtook them. Aren't you glad God's power is greater than the enemy's power? Amen. Amen. That God puts our enemies in darkness and brings us through to light. Amen. Amen. I love that. So as, as, as Joshua was, was speaking to them, and, and uh, he, he, he reminded them of how good God is to them. He said, God has given you a city. He said, you didn't build the city. He's given you vineyards that you didn't even plant, but yet you enjoy the, the, the fruits of that. Uh, uh, do you know how good God is to you? Do we realize how good God is to us? We serve a great, big, wonderful God. Amen. We really are partakers of things where some of us didn't labor. Amen. Even in the early years of this church, we didn't labor there. We were, we're blessed with the fruits of, uh, of things, but, but more so we're blessed with the fruits of righteousness. So thank God for that. But when you look at Joshua, Joshua, uh, 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 when, when you look at him, he is really a... A, um, a type of Jesus. And uh, Jesus really in the Greek is Joshua. 
Uh, and, and so uh, when we when we look at Joshua leading the people to the promised land, God leads us to a promised land. You may say, Pastor Bill, sometimes I get confused on all that stuff when we talk about the promised land and isn't that heaven? Well, the promised land is more of a type of a victorious Christian life, a place where God allows us to live. And the reason why we can say that is was because they were surrounded by the Jebusites and the Canaanites. And they were surrounded by enemies. When we get to heaven, we will not have any enemies. They will be done away with. But in this world, we have enemies that war against our soul. But God gives us a land of promise that we can live in, a land of inheritance, a land where there are blessings. And so I, I need to tell you, if we are going to be that church member, we have to realize that God has given us a place where our enemy has been defeated. We have an enemy that's against our soul, and he'll want to discourage us. He'll lie to us. He'll do all types of things. He's been around a long time. He'll do whatever he can to discourage us, but God has promised us, and, and, and Christ filled the role of a prophet, a priest, and a king, and, and Joshua uh, was, 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 was really prophetic in, 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 in a sense, and, uh, and so he led them to the promised land. God wants us to live in a promised land. A place where His blessings flow. A place where He gives us victory. What gives us that victory to get up and conquer our day and face those things that maybe we don't want to face? Or what gives us joy in the middle of our journey? It is knowing that God has given us a victorious place to live. No matter how poor we are, no matter how sick we are, no matter what the situation is, God says, I am your hope and I am your promise and you can live in victory. I love this. Have any of you ever seen someone before that has went for a tragic loss? And we, we, we grieve a lot of things in life at times. But, you know, whether it's a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of, uh, well, whatever it is, there's a grieving process that, that takes place. But, but I love when folks go through the grieving process and then they learn to live again. So uh, I got to see a lady today that her husband was a great, 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 great guy and a uh, wonderful man, got sick. And his sickness with the complications, he died. Ran into her through the years. Our journey has allowed us to cross paths. And, uh, I remember one day in particular, I was uh, uh, taking a walk uh, down Millersburg along the river for my break and ran into this individual. It was just uh, very difficult. And, and, and so I, I got to run into this individual again. And I said, hello. And she's, hello, how are you doing? It's always good to see you. She ran over and she gave me a hug. That's kind of unusual. We were friends, but she was definitely very happy. And, and so I said, how are you? What's new? I've not seen you for a while. What's new? And her face lit. I knew something great had happened. Well, let's make a very long story short. You know, sometimes people's spouses die. And God allows them to meet someone else. And she did. And she had a great big engagement ring on her hand after a few years. And, and I looked at her and I said, I, she, she got tearful. I said, it's okay. You're learning to live again. Do you know what? That's what the promised land is. Learning to live. Amen. In a world that's full of sin. In a world that's full of doubt. In a world where there's enemies against our soul. But God says, you can live here and you can live joyously. Amen. And Joshua said, you, 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 you took the land. Continue to take the land. Amen. You, 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 you want to live there. You want to own it. It's victorious. Amen. And then he says, but there's something that's needful. If you are going to live in this land, you got to get rid of your idols. you got to live close to the cross. And the cross has got to be the greatest thing in your life. 
That is living. And I believe sometimes we as Christians, we need to learn to live again because we're not inhabiting the promised land. We're not living where God has for us. Joshua in his farewell, he said, my heart's grieved. Amen. Because I'm not sure that you're engaging in the life that God wants you to engage in and live in. God has brought you out of Egypt. Uh, God has, has delivered your forefathers. Amen. And God has given you a great place to live. Live there. Amen. Live there. Live there. He begins by starting out, and you can read in those first 24 verses, he talks about Abraham and how that God has called Abraham from a life of idol making and idol worshiping. Because Abraham really didn't want to serve God, but he was born into this, 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 this uh, cycle of creating images and gods, and, and, but his heart longs for God. And so, as he's longing for God, because Abraham, though he was an idol worship, worshiper, his heart longed for something more. His heart longed for God. Amen. A God who he would discover that would give him grace and would save him. And so, Joshua reminds the children of Israel, Amen, put away your idols. God saved Abraham from that. He longed for God. He longed for purity. He longed for the real God. And God delivered him by grace. Amen. Right here, right now, tonight, everyone who's been by Calvary, amen, glory to his name. We sung that tonight. You know why we can sing glory to his name? Because we've been by Calvary, amen, and we no longer seek to worship anything or anyone else, but we long to worship God. So here it is that Joshua said, unfortunately, God delivered Abraham, your forefathers, from idols. That's a good thing, but unfortunately, we're reverting back to that. Do you remember what this God did for us? This God is a God who does miraculous things. When you were in Egypt, He provided for you. He provided for Abraham. He delivered you from Egypt. He brought you through the wilderness. And He provided for you. And then the reminder of what Hebrews 3, 13, 8 says uh, for us today, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have to know that God doesn't change He's still a miraculous God who's working in our midst, and we have to expect that. And then Joshua says to him in verse number 23, he says, Joshua said unto the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you the Lord to him, uh, uh, you, you the Lord to serve him. And they say, we are witnesses. In verse number 23, he says, Now therefore put away, he said, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Despite the great things that God had done for him, for them, they still allowed their heart to yearn after things that was displeasing to God. If we are going to be a church member and we're going to be an effective church member, there is going to be that place where we keep Jesus Christ as the center of our life. Amen. As we remember the blood of Jesus, when we remember the cross of Calvary, when we allow the power of the Holy Ghost and allowing Him to sanctify us daily throughout our lifetime, when we keep that as a center, that's when we are an effective church and we're an effective church member for the kingdom of God. So we have to remove the idols. How quickly it is we forget what God has done for us. Amen. So as Joshua says this to him, you, you, you remember the great things that God has done for us. Sometimes we get caught up in churches. We get caught up in denominations. We get caught up in the activities. Amen. Sometimes he even will make idols out of preachers. But God wants us to keep our eyes upon Him. 
What are the things? God has done great things in our life. Let's remind ourselves. We just heard how God touched Brother Eli. The powerful service we had on Sunday night. If you weren't here, Brother Eli, he was slain out in the spirit on Sunday night. Amen. God touched Brother Eli. And then he testifies of God healing his body. And it was evidence on Monday morning. We heard about God touching Sister Jan's sister-in-law. She was very concerned about this mass and the seriousness of the surgery. How long it will last. God touched and, and was with and gave successful outcomes. Amen. We serve a mighty God. And the list goes on down through our history. We need to remind ourselves of that. That we don't allow anything else to take the place of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. I don't know if I'm just going to say that. I even had a 15 question. It says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Very familiar, probably the most prominent verse out of this whole chapter. We know that. But Joshua makes a declaration there at his farewell as he's getting ready to die. What a great legacy he leaves to his family. We've talked about that a lot recently. Leaving a legacy. And that legacy of, of as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Amen. That's a legacy that, that, that we're going to leave. So Joshua, uh, uh, his leadership, he's, 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 he's not uh, uh, just simply uh, talking about some religious hierarchy. He's talking about the hand of God working and moving in their midst. You know what? I don't want this church to be talked about as a religious hierarchy. But what the hand of God does in our midst. Amen. The hand of God is able to comfort. Amen. Sometimes this is what I pray because I've struggled sometimes with faith and my seeing. You know, we, 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 can, we can make fun of Thomas and call him down on Thomas. God, I'm not going to believe until I thrust my hand, until I, the, 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 the nail press, until, until I, I, I feel the wounds. But when he saw it and he experienced it, he believed. So sometimes I just say, God, take your nail scar hand and let me hold it so that I can believe. Let my faith be a reality. My faith is wavering. So God, help me. Help me to reflect and look and realize that I don't need anything else but you. You have been faithful. And I don't want anything else in my life to be an idol. I trust you with this. Amen. So, so that should be the challenge of us as individuals and as a church. Amen. That, 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 that the, the Bible and, and the cross of Jesus Christ is the center of our worship and the center of our affection. How do we do that? How do we best do that? I believe this. That as we come into the New Testament, that the thing that makes the difference is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Spirit of God. It's interesting that we look and we see that when we look at Pentecost, and we are Pentecostal, I still believe in Pentecost, you know, uh, I believe that salvation is a very important, it is vital for salvation, there's no other way, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, salvation. But I believe equally so that we as believers should take on the doctrine of sanctification as well. It's easy to practice salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ, and confessing our sins and asking them to our heart. But it's something else when we take the next step and we live this life, lifetime of allowing the Spirit of God to sanctify us. And so here they are in the Old Testament, and Joshua was reminded them to get rid of their idols. Get rid of them. Keep God number one in your life. Uh, I'm about to go off the scene. Moses promised God was faithful with Moses. I'm about to go off the scene. I brought you into a land that you're inhabiting that you, you, didn't, you didn't labor for any of this stuff, but God blessed you with it because it's the promise of God with Justin. 
And so the promises of God that we can live and uh, uh, even though we don't deserve them, God gives them to us. I believe the way that we can occupy them best is allowing the Holy Ghost to work our life. When we look at the New Testament, there's a few things in which, in which uh, the Holy Ghost is, is symbolic of. And uh, let's talk about two, uh, and then I'm going to focus on the final two uh, as we, uh, as we uh, do, do the final ending of Bible study tonight. So there's four things that the Holy Ghost is symbolic of, four symbols. Oil, a dove, wind, fire. Those are for particular. And so I want to look at them for just a moment. When we look at oil, oil was poured upon the head of anybody who was anointed to be king from, from the head down over the body. And uh, so uh, it, it, it represented a place of consecration for the office in which they were called. If we are going to live a Christian life that is pleasing to God, that is consistent we need the Holy Ghost all over us. Pour from our head, from everything that we think, to what comes in our ears and out of our mouth, down over our body and all of our actions. I want them to be led by the Spirit of God. The Old Testament, they didn't have that. Amen. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. Amen. They were still working on sacrifices. Amen. Joshua was reminding them of the faithfulness of God and encouraging them to be faithful. But once Jesus came, amen, and He became the supreme sacrifice, He then opened the floodgate of heaven for the Holy Ghost to be poured out. He said, I must go away, but I will send you another comforter. Amen. Uh, that same Spirit that anointed Jesus that was upon Him to, to, to heal the sick, to, 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 to break the chains, uh, 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 is the same Spirit of God that is in us and upon us when we seek the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. We need the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so, having the Holy Ghost poured out upon us, the second thing that I see is a symbol of the Holy Ghost is not only the oil, but is the dove. Remember when Jesus was baptized, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, at Luke chapter number 3, the, the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. Uh, uh, a couple of things that, that are representative of that there is, uh, it is the gentleness of the Spirit of God and the comfort that comes with that. The Spirit of God is a gentleman. Amen. Sin will send him to flight. Disrespect will send him to flight. Amen. But God, send us the Holy Ghost because we need His gentleness. We need that gentle spirit. We need that comfort. So, uh, also symbolic, I guess I didn't say this, but also living water. Water is a symbol of, uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, in John chapter number 7, you can read that there. And so, when we read about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter number 2, we read that there's two things that are pretty prevalent about the Holy Ghost, and that, and that is that it was a mighty rushing wind. And it was cloven tongues like as a fire. And so I need to tell you that there are some things that are pretty powerful in life. Wind is powerful and fire is powerful. Both of those two elements in itself are powerful. Now understand that the enemy is powerful. Satan and all of his devices and all of his schemes are powerful. But the Spirit of God is more powerful than even the enemy. Amen, Brother Al, you said it well last week. The enemy has been around a long time. And so he is wiser, he is more deceptive than anything our minds can even imagine. And so we are no, uh, we are no uh, 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 arrival against the enemy within ourselves. We will never conquer Satan. But when the power of the Holy Ghost gets in us, amen, and uh, He begins to work in us, we can have authority over the forces of hell. Right. Right. Amen. 
We can take authority over that. <coughs> Amen. Those things that we want to destroy our lives or the lives of our loved ones, we can see those forces broken through the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe that's what church is about. I believe that's what God wants the church to be. Amen. A powerful, dynamic force. Amen. As the Holy Ghost works in and through us. So it's a dove. It's oil. It's water. But it's wind and fire. And so, I love in Luke chapter number Verse number one, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We find that after his baptism, he goes and he's tempted of the enemy. How did he overcome? Because the Spirit of God was upon him. As a church, if we are going to see great exploits for the kingdom of God, it's going to happen when the Spirit of God rests upon us. There are times in our lives, and from my experience, there are times where our thoughts can wonder, how am I going to do this? How am I going to say? How am I going to respond? How, how am I going to handle the situation? But then we enter that place of prayer where the Spirit of God just allows every one of those thoughts to flee. And we realize that this is not by our might and it's not by our power, but it's by the Spirit of God. You hear it? It's not by our might. It's not by our power. The church has tried to operate too often in its own might and its own power when we need to operate in the Holy Ghost. God help us that we can see lives changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Amen. Jesus was showing that he even himself needed the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, to work in his life. He has anointed me. Amen. The anointing belongs to the Holy Ghost. Even Christ gave acknowledgement to that. Amen. He says, He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Amen. I'm not talking about going out and working every welfare avenue in our towns. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the poor in spirit. Amen. They need Jesus. Amen. Their spirit needs to have uh, the riches of Christ. Amen. And then he goes on down to say, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Do you know sin breaks the heart? Amen. But the Holy Ghost mends the heart. Amen. And to preach deliverance to the captives. Amen. Do uh, 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 you know what the, the message is? It's the message of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. It brings healing and it brings deliverance. And to set at liberty those who are bruised. What is that? Those who are in prison, those who are infected spiritually, God is able to heal them. God help us through the power of God to see lives healed. Amen. Amen. You know what the purpose of the power was? It was to fulfill the to go out to all of them. 
if we are going to be effective in the world, it's going to take the Spirit of God in our life. Joshua said, get rid of your idols. Anything that takes priority to God. We come to the New Testament. How do we do it? The Holy Ghost gives us the ability to prioritize Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost gives us the ability to sanctify our lives and get rid of things so that the Spirit of God can flow through us and we can be effective for the kingdom of God. Amen. It, that is the purpose. Amen. Fire speaks of purifying. Amen. Uh, when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 49, amen, that we may be in the image of the heavenly. You know how we're, we're created in the image of the heavenly? As we are purified by the Spirit of God. And so, uh, uh, really, the, the final type of the Holy Ghost that we see in the Word of God is the fire. That's what, that's what we, we are seeing. And I believe that, that, that by far, the fire is probably the greatest thing that the Holy Ghost does in our lives. I said it before, amen, but the doctrine of sanctification should be important in our life, just as important as a doctrine of salvation. God, sanctify me. Purify me. Let me be holy for you. You know, sanctification can be violent to the flesh, but it is liberating to the Spirit. Can I say that again? Sanctification can be violent to the flesh. It can be hard. It can be difficult to eradicate ourselves of sin, but it is liberating to the Spirit that is with John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but, but, but it is he that cometh after me whose who, who shoes, I'm giving you my, 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 my verbiage, whose shirt, shoes I'm not worthy to bear, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I want to close with this thought. Back in Bible times, when they would harvest, and you can read Matthew chapter number 3, He goes on down to say, John the Baptist, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. That means to bring forth more fruit. Gather his wheat unto the garner. It's everything that the Spirit of God does within us. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In this day and age, when they gather the wheat, we don't really much think about this because our food is processed and given to us. We don't have to think about the process of growing and harvesting and, and getting the maximum from what we harvest. But what they would do is they would take that wheat, they would put it on the threshing floor. Round about that, they would walk upon it, they would uh, beat upon it, they would uh, run carts upon it so that they would get that wheat off. And then they would throw it up in the air and they would fan it so that the wind would give them the most optimal harvest. And then uh, uh, as, as, as they were there, Brother Doug, the chaff, the things that were not, that, that were no value to them, they would take it out. And they would burn that. Mm -hmm. Sister Rachel, no need for us to It was not necessary. And they would harvest the good stuff. Brother Al, this is what this is what the Word of God says to us. That the Holy Ghost does that in our life. 
that he burns out the chaff. He gets rid of the things that aren't profitable. And he puts in us the harvest that one day God is going to reap from us. Why do we need the Holy Ghost? It will help us value our time. It will help us value what we should do in the light of eternity for the glory of God. It will help us begin to decipher and determine what are the qualities that are godly qualities in our life and what are not. And God will eradicate those qualities that aren't good. You see, because we were born after our first father, Adam, and we were born into sin, and we inherited the sin nature from him. Everyone who's born after Adam, the fall of Adam, we are all products of that. And so it affects the way we think, it affects the way that we live our life. But the second Adam, because he loved us, came to save us from that fallen nature. Now when we get saved, Jesus doesn't leave the throne of that room of heaven. He still sits on the right hand of God ever making intercession. But the Holy Ghost makes the work of Jesus Christ real in our life. And he comes and he dwells in our hearts. That's salvation. Then when we seek Him to be filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues, that's the fullness of the Spirit. That is being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when we allow the Spirit of God to work in our life, He eradicates that old sin nature. He says, the best part of the harvest in you is the wheat. Let's get rid of the chaff. And the Holy Ghost burns it up. And the wind of the Holy Ghost Amen. It eradicates the good stuff. and it, or it, 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 it takes the good stuff from the bad stuff. It eradicates the bad and keeps the good. So that one day in eternity, the only thing that is harvested in our life are the qualities that Christ wants in us. That is how we're an effective church member. By saying... I'm living in this promised land God has given to me. I don't deserve it, but I'm dwelling there. The cross has given me a promised land. The Holy Ghost has given me a promised land. I'm going to live and eat here. And I'm going to do all that's within me through the power of the Holy Ghost to keep Christ first. I'm going to value my salvation and I'm going to honor sanctification. And in this lifelong process, allow the Spirit of God I'm done. What's that? In the bed, the oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Anybody any thoughts on that?